It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker to, for today, uh, Kurosh Parivar. Uh, we're honored to have Kurosh here today. We're going to learn a lot about oncology drug development. Um, he'll be speaking from a clinical pharmacology perspective, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, Kurosh has a master's in pharmacology, and he's completed a fellowship in pharmacokinetics from UCSF. Uh, he spent the last 30 years working at Pfizer in various roles, his most recent being the vice president of clinical pharmacology for the oncology division. Um, he recently left Pfizer to start his own consulting firm. It's called Top Clin Farm Associates, where he's currently the president. He's also the senior vice president and head of clinical pharmacology at A2AI, with a specific focus on supporting pre-IPO and early phase oncology companies. I know you'll all enjoy his presentation today. He's going to be discussing the new era of oncology drug development. Um, there are definitely a lot of clinical pearls in there, so make sure you stay tuned until the end. With that, I'll hand it over to Kurosh. Thanks, Anna. I appreciate your introduction. <clears throat> My name is Kurosh Parivar. As Anna said, I'm a clinical pharmacologist by training, and I've spent my past 20 years as the head of clinical pharmacology of Pfizer's oncology division, yeah, and the uh, in charge of a portfolio of uh, up around probably 40 products. And during my tenure, we introduced about 14 to 15 oncology enemies to the market with um, probably an additional 14 to 15 supplemental NDAs uh, and BLAs. So my focus today will be a, a brief introduction of uh, where the treatment of oncology started um, about 80 years ago, and where we are going um, today as it comes to the new era of oncology treatment. <clears throat> so we have the, uh, going back 80 years, around 1940, yeah, there was a, 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 a finding that the antifolates were effective in the setting of ALL. Dana Farber managed to kind of manufacture a few folate analogs, yeah, more or less folate antagonists. Yeah, one of them today is known as methotrexate. And when they were introduced to kids, children in a pediatric setting with ALL, they could induce remission. Uh, while the remission was pretty kind of short lasting, it was the uh, new era of the way of oncology drug development that we know of today. So with that in our back kind of background, we can take a look at the, the chemotherapy, which came with that introduction. Yeah, um, needless to say, uh, chemotherapy is it has been around for the past 80 years. And these are type of treatments which are designed to damage the DNA of the tumor cells. And by the, by the way of that kind of mechanism of action, they at the same time do damage the healthy cells too. <clears throat> yeah, let's take a look at quickly at the number of yeah, chemotherapies which have been around. This list is not by any means an exhaustive list of assets. I just wanted to bring on to attention a few of the products which have been used throughout the years. Yeah, as we discussed right now in about 1948, we, were, we started with the antifolates and around 53, we came to six MPs, six Merco, Merco captopurin, and then we went to 5-FU around 1958. As we all know, 5-FU has been very successfully, even to this day, being used for treatment of colorectal cancer, yeah, followed to 1961. We went to Vinca alkaloids like Vincristine, which is still being used. And then um, coming to 1987, we went to taxanes like paclitaxel, which is very readily being used today for multiple different indications and tumor types. And then followed to 1989, where platinums got introduced, like cisplatin, carboplatin, and platinums are readily used products even today for many tumor types. Um, like um, pancreatic cancer, for instance, where cisplatin is being very readily used. Yeah, to be followed with topoisomerases in 1996, like such as irinotecan, followed with uh, nitroureas, and then eventually with topoisomerase twos, like anthracyclines. And again, this list is not um, exhaustive. There are tons of different uh, chemotherapies, uh, and they are being uh, administered through either IV rod or paraoral administration. 
they have uh, they target the different type of tumor types yeah and they are being used either as monotherapy or in combination with other assets yeah and the um, the um, the problem with chemotherapies is as we discussed very briefly is that these agents are pretty non specific meaning that the uh, they not only they damage the uh, the target cell which is the tumor cell but also they damage any other cells which are fast replicating. Yeah, and because of that one, they induced, have been inducing, and still induce a lot of unwanted side effects. And we can take a look at those side effects and why we, uh, there have been a huge attempt throughout the years to go away as much as we can from chemotherapies to new different modality of treatment of oncology, which do have lesser side effects with better safety profile. <clears throat> So the typical side effects of chemos, which I've been alluding to, is because it's non-targeted. It damages any type of cell which is fast replicating. And throughout our body, of course, we have tons of different cells which are fast replicating. A few of them to mention is blood forming cells in bone marrow. You had neutrophils, the, uh, as are a few of those, which protect us against kind of infections. And, uh, and lots of lots of side effects of the chemotherapies do cause severe neutropenia and thereby infections come secondary to that one. Yeah, the uh, you people, patients lose their hair follicles because again, hair follicles do also fast replicate. Skin fast replicates. The cells in the mouse, digestive tract, reproductive system, all of them replicate pretty fast and thereby you get a lot of GI side effects with tons of these chemotherapies, diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea, are pretty usual in this setting. And some chemos, needless to say, they do damage pretty major organs such as heart, the um, cardiomyopathy is one of those. They damage kidneys, bladder, lungs, nervous system. You have, you have peripheral neuropathy, you have axonal damage. So the list of the, uh, the damage that chemotherapies do to non-target uh, tissues is long yeah, and thereby, they cause a lot of side effects while they do at the same time, of course, target their target, which would be the cancer cells. So because of this non-targeted nature of chemotherapies, we have as a drug industry, as, as a healthcare system been trying in the past many years, past 30 years, 40 years, trying to go away from chemotherapies to more targeted agents. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to pretty quickly go through a few of these targeted agents that I personally worked with in the past 25 years. Yeah, the list of targeted agents, needless to say, are a lot longer than the ones I've listed here. I just tried to attempt to list a few bigger targets that we have seen in the past 25 years. Um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, TKIs, are one of those targeted uh, Therapies, the MOA of that one, cyclin dependent kinases, CDKs, another one, monoclonal antibodies, they are also very readily available. And then antibody drug conjugates, ADCs, have had their turn of being very popular. For many years, they become unpopular, and today they are super popular again. In my current business uh, consulting, the pre IPO and IP, post IPO companies, Today, probably 80% of my clients are actually working on large molecules such as ADCs. Peptide drug conjugates have become popular too. Products such as uh, <clears throat> melflufen for multiple myeloma, for instance, is one of the products that I've been working on, and plus a few other PDCs, peptide drug conjugates. It's more or less like an ADC, but of course, much simpler because you're talking about a small peptide connected to a payload. Yeah, then you have biospecifics yeah, have become super popular in the past yeah, five to seven years. And we can indulge discussing a bit of any of every each of these targets. And I am gonna give you a, a bit more information about the type of products and type of tumor types that, that these type of products are being used for. Yeah, um, bite by specific T cell engagers also is coming uh, pretty, strong these days. And then 
yeah, to finish up the uh, list of the targeted therapies, I'm going to talk a bit about chimeric antigen receptors cars. Um, so again, the list is not exhaustive, just I picked a few which are larger, and then I see a lot more of these products coming to my business for consultation. Um, the TKIs, these products have been around for the past the, uh, good 30 years, uh, and they are inhibitors. <clears throat> they inhibit the, uh, the tyrosine kinases are enzymes responsible for activation of many proteins by signal transduction cascade. Yeah, more or less, these proteins are activated by adding a phosphate to the protein phosphorylation, and a TKI more or less just kind of antagonizes and inhibit that phosphorylation and it stops the process downstream. So I put the schematic here, a very simple one, which is more or less kind of highlights two pathways for you. There are tons more pathways, but I just more focused on the PI3K, AKT, mTOR pathway on the right-hand side, the, the pink one, and on the left and the left side, the uh, the yellow one is a RAF pathway, the MAPK pathway. And as you see that there are a number of downstream kind of enzymes. You go from RAF, you start from RAS for both of them. On the left side, you go from RAF to MEC to ERK. On the right hand side, you go from PI3K to AKT to mTOR. Both of them kind of converge in the end through cell proliferation and differentiation and the gene expression, of course. And if you look at the current market from different companies and different type of research being done in academia and industry, you see that more or less for every single of these kind of um, molecules or enzymes, you have a number of inhibitors on the market or under investigation. You have PI3K inhibitors, you have oral and IV form of that one, you have AKT inhibitors, you have mTOR inhibitors, and similarly, you have MAC inhibitors and ERK inhibitors and so forth. So everybody has been trying to somewhere in this downstream cycle to inhibit the progression of the cycle from, from cell surface from up here to towards the uh, gene expression. So yeah, if you look at the targets that have been if used for this TKI, some of which I, I, me and my team in Pfizer, for instance, work with, is like uh, for GIST gastrointestinal stromal tumors, which are sarcomas in your stomach, yeah, and the kidney cancer for RCC, yeah, or for CLL for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or for CML, yeah, or for breast cancer. <clears throat> A few of the products that I personally work with, my team work with, like Sutent, like Inlita, yeah, like others are TKIs, they are, have been registered in the market for GIST, PNET, for RCC. So as you see, they are readily on the market. Uh, these products are, this pathway is a very significant pathway that many companies in the past 25, 30 years have been working with. Yeah, um, a, 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 a bit newer kind of um, pathway is since say 2015 or so, they, uh, has been the cyc cycling dependent kinase, a CDK. <clears throat> and more or less is about cell cycle. The, uh, we have uh, four distinct um, kind of the uh, segments of cell cycle. It starts with the gap one, goes to synthesis, goes to gap two, and go to mitosis. So that's how cell cycle looks like. Yeah, the, uh, the progression from G1 to S to G2 to M is being controlled by a series of complex of cyclins and cycling dependent kinases. The, um, their job is more or less to phosphorylate RB, retinoblastoma. So in unphosphorylated form is inactive, but when it gets phosphorylated, and that, as you see in the below, it becomes active and it just kind of then starts to churn from G1 to S and so forth. So majority of these cycling uh, CDK inhibitors, that being either CDK4, CDK6 or CDK2, their job is to inhibit this phosphorylation. Um, there are tons of products on the market right now. There are three of them on the market. The, uh, one of them is from my former company, the uh, Palbocyclip, uh, which was for uh, metastatic breast cancer. That product is CDK46 inhibitor, but there is now a variety of companies working on either single agent or like CDK4 as a single 
inhibitor, CDK2 as single inhibitor. Nobody's going definitely after CDK6 as a single agent because the belief is that CDK6 is responsible for majority of the safety issues we see with this type of products. Uh, nevertheless, the, um, the, these agents are being worked on they, as their own or in combination, like combining CDK2 plus CDK4. And how you combine them will give you different kind of safety profile, of course. Yeah, um, if you look at, as I was alluding to, the indications that CDK inhibitors are being uh, used for, right now we have uh, palbocycline from Pfizer, ribocycline from Novartis, and abemocycline from Eli Lilly with different type of uh, adverse event profile on the market. Some of them have more GI side effects, and some of them like palbocyclib has more neutropenia as a side effect. The, the, the only thing to, to mention is that the neutropenia that you see, for instance, with the CDK4 or 4.6 is very different type of neutropenia that you see with the chemotherapy because it actually is put it in stasis. It doesn't kill the cells in your bone marrow. It just arrests them at the G, G1 to S. So as soon as you stop your treatment of the patients, it's the, the phosphorylation starts rebounding again, and you get a, a, again, you, you reach a nadir, and after that one, your neutrophils come back to normal within, uh, say, about 21 day or so is the nadir, and after that, you rebound to your baseline. So it's a very different nature of neutropenia you see with these agents. And then some of them have, have less Neutropenia has more GI side effects, for instance. So you can combine them or treat patients with different type of CDK inhibitors based on what type of patient you have, how they are feeling, and then what is the type of uh, side effects or, or issues they have to start with. <clears throat> yeah, another very popular MOA mechanism of action today is monoclonal antibodies, needless to say. Yeah, um, these are, of course, laboratory-made kind of antibodies. In our own body, naturally, we have antibodies produced uh, in order to help our immune system to tag and protect us against the uh, antigen, germs, viruses, bacteria. So somehow the, these agents, where antibodies will help our immune system to recognize them and destruct them. So a monoclonal antibody, which is a laboratory-based antibody, it does the similar thing. It's more or less like, as you see here, it's, it binds to uh, a target. It's like a laser-guided missile. In the, in the laser, in, in military, they use to kind of paint and target the, your target with this laser, and a missile goes exactly follows that one and actually destroys the target. So same is happening here, that you can actually bind a, a, a monoclonal antibody to a certain cell cell based receptor, it could be a, a tumor associated antigen, and there are many of them. You can target your monoclonal antibody against that target, and then your immune system will identify that one and destroy that one. In the next slide, I will go through a series of different ways monoclonal antibodies work, but one of the most relevant one of them is this targeting and painting the system. A good example of that one is rituximab, for instance. It binds to a protein called CD20, which is present on the B cells and some cancer cells, and then becomes uh, causing the immune system to go and kill them. Um, I listed about probably nine or 10 different ways that a monoclonal, monoclonal antibody works. Yeah, the first one was exactly that we were speaking about right now, flagging cancer cells for the immune system to destruct them. But the, the bigger ones, in my opinion, are kind of is like the lower end of this, this list would be like delivering radiation treatment to the cancer cells. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a, an armed antibody, but instead of having a chemo, you have the, a, a radiation, a kind of a radio, nuclear, radio pharmacy connected to it, more or less. Yeah, or delivering chemotherapies. Yeah, um, as we talked about the armed antibodies, I will be talking about armed antibodies. These, these type of monoclonal antibodies could be loaded with a payload. The payload could be a chemotherapy. 
The payload could be even be a die. I've seen I've examples of that one that these are loaded with dies, and the die could be eventually kind of activated with laser, with light, yeah, superficially from outside. So, yeah, so as you see, there are multiple different ways that that we could use monoclonal antibodies in uh, in order to attack the cancer cells and target against them. Yeah. Um, ADCs, we were just talking about that one. It's one of the ways that monoclonal antibodies could be used. It's an armed antibody. As you see here on the right-hand side, it's a schematic of an antibody with FC fraction down here, and then you have the fabs up here, but you see that these linkers, the green ones, are actually connected to payloads. These payloads are usually cytotoxic drugs, but not necessarily. You can you can connect dyes. You can connect radio radio pharmacy to that one. You can connect to a series of different things, which eventually going to get released inside the cancer tumor cells. What happens is that this portion of the ADC is targeted against a certain tumor associated antigen, and it could be the list is long for those. Yeah, and 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 ADC will find its target. Will dock it gets the whole complex gets internalized within the cell and that's where it, the linker will releases the payload and the payload will make, makes a damage internally within the cell leading to apoptosis and cell, cell, cell destruction. <clears throat> the idea has been and it still is that by this type of a strategy of targeting you will limit the side effects of cytotoxics yeah because the, the ADC is going around and finding the target and within that target a tumor cell will explode and thereby leaving the healthy cells kind of free. This is um, on the paper, great strategy. Throughout the years, I've seen um, lots of ADCs. I've killed more ADCs that I've put on the market, being honest with you. Yeah, mostly the older ADCs, their problem was they had shedding of the payload. And those led to lots of off-target toxicity, such as cardiotoxin X. The newer type of ADCs, which I'm gonna touch a bit, bit more on, are, are a lot more stable when it comes to the linker kind of technology and why they are back again and very heavily uh, in the market. Um, <clears throat> a few examples of ADCs that you guys have all seen. Um, and, and HER2, which is a targets HER2, and by virtue of that one is used for breast cancer and gastric cancer. Yeah, you have a, a Trodelvi, which targets TROP2, and it works on triple negative breast cancer and UC, and, and PADSEV, which targets Nectin4, and that's for treatment of UC. As you see, they are targeting different type of receptors, <clears throat> different targets, Different tumor types have over exaggeration and then of different uh, receptors on the surface, which then makes the uh, the game fairly easy, meaning that you can actually, if then you know which target for which tumor type is overexpressed, then you can target an ADC against that specific target. And thereby you will have different ADCs for different tumor types. <clears throat> Well, differentiation factor for ADCs. I was trying a bit telling you guys that, there, that when it comes to ADCs, more of them have died that made it to the market. Mostly they were because of the payloads. There are three items for differentiating ADCs. The type of the monoclonal antibody that is used as a base, it could be a different IgGs, IgG1 and IgG4. They are the most usual ones. They, they, they differentiate on the payload that they are using. A few examples could be calicomycin or a topoisomerase and the linker stability. And the, the main area of differentiation between poor ADCs and good ADCs has been the linker stability, in my opinion. There are a few different linkers that have been used in the past, then the MC linkers, a millimeter linker, a VC linker, valine, the citrulline linker, and the new linker strategy, that, which I was alluding to, <clears throat> is a tire bridge um, strategy or, or, or platform where a company in North Carolina called Abzina has been working on very readily. And, and this is a kind of a covalent binding kind of platform of the payload 
to the uh, to the antibody and it has virtually very small close to zero shedding of the data i've seen for a few of my clients one more thing would be that when it has a very stable dar drug to antibody ratio it keeps that one around three to four you don't really want to go lower than two because it becomes ineffective and if you go to dars around six and such the shedding increases so everybody wants to have a very stable dar around three to four and then with this new kind of platform you can actually control that one very very nicely <clears throat> um one more target that the, uh, is fairly similar to adc is a peptide drug conjugate a yeah, similar strategy but now instead of a large antibody you have a small peptide so you have your peptide connected to a drug with a linker and what happens is that of course it finds your receptor again whatever receptor you're looking for is usually usually an overexpressed receptor for certain tumor type and it's the peptide part will target that receptor and then it gets kind of internalized through endocytosis and makes its way to endosome where you can have a cleavage of the drug a recycling of the actual receptor to the surface and the release of the drug and eventually a, 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 a destruction of the cell. Yeah, so it's, it's, it works. It's, it's, it's an easier product to make. Um, let me just kind of a bit touch based on advantages of PDC to ADC because people will be asking why. Um, P peptides, as we all know, are yeah, very short half-life products. Within minutes, they get chopped down by peptidases and, and other, other products in, in your blood system. Yeah, so the, the, these are not long lasting like, like ADCs and IgG1 and IgG4 will be around half-life about 21 days or 25 days. That's not the case for PDCs. PDCs are short half-life. They find the target, they get bound to that one very quickly within say 15 to 20 minutes. They get internalized and are inside the cell and they make their damage. So um, they are much quicker. They are smaller kind of molecules, they kind of a smaller molecular weight. They have a strong tumor penetration as I was telling you because they're much smaller. They, they do have much lower immunogenicity as compared to ADCs. In addition, they are much easier to produce and cheaper and faster. So, so there are tons of advantages for a PDC. The only disadvantage is the shorter half-life. And then there are people who are trying to, uh, to apply different type of methods to make these PDCs longer lasting. I'm not gonna indulge in that one, but there are different ways of making that happen. Um, biospecifics, which have had a huge surge in the past five to six, seven years, for uh, specifically for uh, hematologic malignancies, such as multiple myeloma, <clears throat> have been very successful in treating them. It's again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an entity which has yeah, two different kind of uh, receptors within the same antibody, more or less. It, it, it binds to two different things. For instance, if you look here in this schematic, this is for multiple myeloma. It, it targets on one end the BCMA tumor target for, for multiple myeloma. And the other end, it binds to T cell through a CD3, which is a typical type of T cell target for majority of the products. Yeah, and by virtue of that one, you have the complex binding to each other. It activates the T cell. You get cytokine, cytolytic enzyme release, and thereby it damages the multiple myeloma cell and destructs them. Um, it, it's the, it, it is very effective for treatment of multiple myeloma. It has certain side effects such as cytokine release syndrome and X and Y, which I'm not going to talk much about right now today, but there are ways of actually managing that one by a step up dosing, meaning that you actually give a lower dose from the beginning for, for a few days, and then you go for second dose and third dose. You usually are able to manage that one by either one step or two step a step up dosing to manage your cytokine release syndrome at grade two or below. <clears throat> um, there are examples of biospecifics. I'm gonna kind of 
mentioned two of them, teclistamab from Janssen for multiple myeloma. It got registered sometime by middle of last year. It got registered by the US FDA. And the last product, which I personally and my team put in our market for registration before I left, yeah, was in last December, two or three months ago, we managed to submit to the US FDA a product, Elanotomab for multiple myeloma, which is also a BCMA <clears throat> um, type of a, a biospecific. One more type of a mechanism of action for this type of products is BITE. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. These products are actually quite attractive. Well, so what has happened is more or less you have gotten rid of the FC part of a, 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 an antibody and you take the, 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 the single chain variable fraction of the two of them, bind them together. And one of the side of that one, as you see here in the lower part piece goes and gets connected to your, to your uh, immune system, uh, in this case, CD3. And the other side of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, SCFV gets connected to your tumor side. <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's very attractive because it doesn't really require MHC for introduction of the, uh, the tumor to the T cell. So by virtue of that one, it's very laser focused. It's a lot easier to work with. And it's, it's, it's very effective for treatment of the uh, different type tumor types the, uh, that bites are being introduced for. <clears throat> there are exemplifying of them. There are a few of them around. I just took three of them. Yeah, yeah, map, as you may know, it's, it's again, it goes for CD19 receptor. Uh, it gets registered by the US FDA for a acute lymphoblastic leukemia. <clears throat> Um, solitumab, for instance, again, is, is links the T cell to EPCAM antigen, and it's for colon and gastric and prostate cancer. A bunch of different types of cancer, type of cancers are effective, including pan potentially pancreatic cancer, which has been a graveyard for drug development as so far. And the, <clears throat> and the last example is Toben uh, uh, Tafosp. Yeah, again, this one, is a is a bite yeah, targeting the uh, HLA eight zero two zero one positive adult patients for unresectable metastatic uveal melanoma. So uh, th these are very effective agents. They are growing in the number, as I'm seeing from different uh, research companies are working on this. Yeah, on the T cell engagers. <clears throat> and the last the uh, kind of modality I'm going to quickly touch up and is chimeric antigen receptor CAR-Ts. Um, CAR-Ts were introduced some 10 years ago. Two companies called June and Kite yeah, start working on them. At the time, it was lukewarm because this product, despite the fact that they were very effective, they actually led to mismanagement of their side effects. And unfortunately, few patients during drug development time, they, uh, they passed away due to their side effects, mostly CRS kind of um, higher grade CRS. <clears throat> Throughout the years, we have managed to learn a lot more about CAR-Ts and how to manage them. Yeah, these products are <clears throat> a part of the kind of manipulation of your T cells. Your T cells get collected from your system. It gets kind of um, separated from the rest of the cells, which gets reintroduced to you. The T cell then is manipulated by Transfection. Here's a kind of quick schematic where I get to how you add the, uh, the cell receptors, the surface receptors that you want <clears throat> are being added to the uh, to the T cell. And you see here where you got to integration and transcription and protein expression. You incubate them, you increase the number of cards, and then you pre treat your patients by uh, lymphodepletion and conditioning before reintroducing the, uh, the huge number of these cells back to the patient. Yeah, by lymphodepletion and conditioning, you actually are opening a space for the CAR-Ts to be reintroduced to the patients. And then you monitor them, of course. <clears throat> Properly managed, uh, the CAR-Ts have shown to be super effective and to the level of curative. 
for hematologic malignancies. Now, there is a huge drive to go away from not only hematologic malignancies, but also I'm seeing clients who are working on the, the solid tumor side. So, um, so not only do you are seeing a lot more work on newer CAR Ts coming for hematologic malignancies, you are seeing them to be introduced for solid tumors too. <clears throat> a few examples of CAR Ts currently uh, approved include uh, Tysa cell, Axis cell, Lysocell, Ida cell, and Silta cell, yeah, different ones. And I, again, all of these assets have shown to be enormously effective for heme malignancies. <clears throat> their, their safety profile, we just talked about those. There are the two bigger problems with these assets are the CS, CRS, cytokine release syndrome. Yeah, um, the, it can flood the system or by virtue of that one. It can lead to a number of really nasty side effects, high fever, it, uh, trouble with breathing, severe nausea, vomiting and diarrhea, <clears throat> headaches, the heartbeat gonna go up, the uh, muscle and joint uh, pain, of course. On the, on, the, on the CNS side, you can have headaches, you have changes to consciousness, confusion, agitation, seizures, unfortunately, loss of balance and X and Y. <clears throat> yeah. We have, as an industry, learned how to deal with these. And in these days, majority of these side effects are kept at, at grade two CRS or lower. The uh, US FDA has shown a huge amount of focus on this thing. In, you know, in past, you could come with grade three or above, and you potentially could get your products to the market. These days, even grade two at frequencies of above 40%, is uh, something that the FDA is not going to accept. They're going to push back on that one. They're going to ask you to go back and redesign your dosing strategy so that you can keep that grade two below 40%. <clears throat> um, so, so we just leave the uh, chemos and the newer modalities behind us. Now I'm going to start at the clinical end of that one and bit focus about where we started 80 years ago yeah, with dosing chemos and how these dose finding strategies stuck with us to until very recently. So chemos were developed in a way of a traditional three plus three design, <clears throat> which meant that the um, very quickly that they put three patients on a dose, they gave the one dose to three patients. And if the patient did not have a DLT, a dose limiting toxicity, and these toxicities were predefined in their protocols. <clears throat> so if you didn't have, if zero of the three patients didn't have a DLT, that dose was identified as safe. And what happened, you went to the next dose level and the next dose level. <clears throat> However, if more than two of the three patients had an issue with that dose, the dose was identified as not safe. If this happened at get-go, the uh, sponsor needed to go back, redesign the protocol, and start testing lower doses. But if you had one of the three patients you know, coming down with a DLT, what happened, uh, three more patients were added, and that's the name of three plus three. You started with three, you add another three, becomes a total of six, and then you'd make the same assessment again. This time, do you have less than one out of the six? If you do, the dose is safe, you go to the next. If you had two out of the six, which is 33%, yeah, coming down with the DLT, the dose was unsafe. <clears throat> so it's a very quick and dirty and crude system for a dose identification, a maximum tolerated dose. So they went up from dose level one to two and three, and eventually ended up by many, many doses probably six or seven or eight those steps, and eventually you ended up somewhere with a maximum tolerated dose above which you all had read, meaning that you couldn't go up. <clears throat> and this MTD was then taken as the go forward dose for the rest of the life cycle of the product. While it made, this made a lot of sense for chemotherapies at the time, because the, in chemo, more or less safety and efficacy has superimposed more or less. You need to hit certain side effects and they could be a biomarker of efficacy. However, this is not a very good way for developing targeted agents. <clears throat> so 
the, this approach made sense for chemos. It doesn't make sense for, for the targeted therapies. Some of the, uh, the shortcomings of this method is that it just looks at the uh, dose limiting toxicities during one cycle only. And the issue is that it usually underestimates the safety profile and issues of an asset because a lot of side effects are temporal, meaning that they actually build from cycle one into cycle two and cycle three, it just accumulates. <clears throat> Many of these could be of different natures. The, um, you know, some, one of them as an example could be, for instance, peripheral neuro neuropathy, PN, which goes from cycle to cycle, it builds. You may not capture that one after 28 days, However, sometime down the road, after three cycles or four cycles, your patients are coming down with PN, which means that the dose you identified in your first cycle is, is, is a not an appropriate dose for longer term therapies. <clears throat> so um, yeah, again, I mean, I just alluded a bit here. I'm saying that the majority of the newer targeted therapies are, <clears throat> are enzyme inhibitors. They, they follow what we call an Emax exposure response, meaning that your eventually your efficacy is going to plateau out. Yeah, and going above a certain level in dose and concentration doesn't really buy you more efficacy. The only thing it buys you is more safety issues. <clears throat> so about say two and a half years ago in October 2021. FDA caught up on this issue and made a total 360 in their development kind of paradigm. Until then, FDA was okay with using MTD. They were very lenient working with the sponsors. They had a high tolerance for side effects. And then suddenly two and a half, three years ago, they changed their mind and became more, fell in line with other therapeutic areas as it comes to drug development. Meaning that they were requiring more kind of elaboration of the dose response, testing more doses to identify a proper dose for the uh, <clears throat> for longer term treatment. Yeah, um, this is this is slide just kind of explains why the FDA started that one because the FDA started thinking that uh, the, that incorrect doses have been used for majority of the products, and by virtue of that one, the uh, the a lot of products were inducing severe toxicities and high rate of dose reductions and then disruptions. <clears throat> and what Project Optimus is more or less um, prescribing is that in order to identify the most optimal dose of an oncology asset, two or three different doses need to be tested, a minimum of two doses. Bear in mind for other therapeutic areas such as diabetes and other assets, you usually test about five different doses, if not more. Here, at least the FDA put the minimum to be two doses. Those two doses usually is the MTD and a lower dose, which is identified as the biological optimal dose, yeah, <clears throat> OBD. Um, so, um, and these two doses, I mean, MTD is easy to identify as we described before. The OBD is a bit more difficult. It, you need to identify that one based on your preclinical studies using your TGI data, maybe your the, um, the, um, NHP kind of uh, the type of studies in your, when you're doing your GLP studies, you can get lead from at which concentrations these animals are showing a potential efficacy and use a translation of that concentration to human setting and come up with an idea of where potentially you would be expecting to see efficacy in, in, in human setting. <clears throat> um, so, and then of course, at the same time, the FDA wants to see the MTD and OBD to be separated from each other kinetically. A lot of people choose these too close to each other with having the kinetic variability overlapping, which at the end of testing the two doses, you, your results will be non-conclusive. You, you can't take a decision very good to which dose is better. So you need to choose two doses separate enough from each other that the PK variability is not overlapping. So <clears throat> also the exposure response analysis. Yeah, the, um, it's, it's in this setting, the exposure response analysis is an integral part of identification of recommended phase two dose. 
uh, FDA is almost categorically sending um, 70, 80% of the sponsors back today with a lecture to them that they haven't done proper dose identification and their emphasis is actually on exposure, exposure response modeling. They're asking the, uh, the uh, sponsors to perform not only the categorical analysis of looking at the uh, correlation of the dose with side effects and X and Y and Z, but also they're asking the sponsors to look at the concentrations at those levels um, and correlate that one with efficacy and with safety and try to identify the therapeutic index and thereby a dose in between, which is uh, safe enough with maximum efficacy, of course. <clears throat> and in doing so, you're asking people to do use biomarkers and clinical endpoints and safety endpoints to pinpoint this optimal dose. <clears throat> the general consensus from the OCE Oncology Center of Excellence in a discussion that they kept with them a few years ago was that they are under certain belief that 70% of the current oncology products on the market, which are being used by patients, are being overdosed to the patients and thereby they want to categorically decrease that burden on the patients. Um, I was talking a bit about exposure response yeah, and about, about the Emax kind of relationship and majority of these enzyme inhibitors, which are typical for most of the new MOAs. And in, in, in this setting, you have an efficacy parameter, which is defined by the Emax model here, yeah, with the green, and you have the similar type of Emax model for toxicity, usually for good products such as the um, newer products, these two curves are separating from each other. Usually you hit the efficacy on the left-hand side first, and then eventually you hit the toxicity. <clears throat> if, if you can follow my marker, if you see that eventually the efficacy will plateau out. So in, in, in past you have gone to MTD, meaning that you have gone farther and farther and farther here across the exposure level, which is down here. Of course, if you increase the dose more and more to the right, you get more and more concentrations, but at the same time, you don't buy more efficacy because you're already maxed out in efficacy. <clears throat> what you buy is more toxicity because the toxicity curve it falls kind of right to the efficacy curve. So by increasing exposure, while you don't buy more efficacy, you're actually buying more toxicity. <clears throat> and that's what an ER exposure response modeling is actually able to quantify for you, the relationship between efficacy and safety. <clears throat> yeah, for, the, um, for chemotherapies, if you look at this curve, <clears throat> that separation was very narrow or even not there. You, you could be in a situation that you actually hit the uh, toxicity curve prior to efficacy curve. Or if you had a separation, it was a very narrow separation, as you see, between the tumor control and damage to normal tissue. So with that small TI, the therapeutic index, which is very narrow, these type of drugs are super difficult to kind of to develop. Yeah. And this is the uh, huge advantage between a, a, a old style chemotherapy to a newer kind of mechanism of action which separates the efficacy and toxicity from each other. <clears throat> um, in performing all this exposure response modeling that I've been talking about, we look at different efficacy endpoints, of course. In oncology, the efficacy endpoints are very well established, published by the FDA. You know which efficacy endpoint for which tumor type is accepted by the US FDA. You could potentially use biomarkers like CTC and CTDNA for internal decision-taking within your own company as a go-no-go. -go. <clears throat> Sometimes if you get lucky and your biomarker is validated, you can even use that one for your registration, but usually that's not the case. Yeah. <clears throat> the other clinical um, validated kind of efficacy endpoints are ORR objective response rate, the clinical benefit ratio, which is a, a, a hybrid of partial response, complete response, stable disease for at least one cycle, 
You can put them together, call them CBR, <clears throat> or you can have event-free survival, PFS, progression-free survival, and at last the, the golden standard of all kind of endpoints, overall survival, meaning that when the patient, the duration from the treatment to the time that patient actually expires. So we effectively use this dif different type of efficacy markers for our exposure response modeling. On the flip side, <clears throat> we need to use to do the same for exposure response for safety. And we use different kind of safety endpoints. They could be neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, GI side effects such as diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, fatigue, CRS, the uh, peripheral neuropathy. You, this, this type of a list of the side effects are long <clears throat> and it could be differing based on the MOA of product. The, the, my only advice would be that sponsors should use kind of two or three, identify two or three top dose limiting AEs for such an analysis and do not focus on a list of 10 different ones because that will make the situation even more convoluted. <clears throat> um, nevertheless, the FDA, when they look at both categorical and exposure response analysis, in the categorical analysis, any dose which has a cumulative number or prevalence of dose reduction, dose delay, and dose discontinuation is all these three put together is more than 50%, the FDA consider that dose to be too high and will send the sponsor back and tell them to go test the lower dose. So that's the categorical analysis part of it. And then on top of that one, you have the quantitative analysis to our via exposure response modeling. <clears throat> Role of biomarkers, we just quickly touched upon that one. The, uh, this is a, a growing field. In, as long as I've worked in oncology, we have invested for years in identifying solid uh, type of markers. Markers could be all different variety. It could be imaging guided. They could be CT, MRI, or PET. Yeah, you can look at the SUV of the product, try to see if your treatment is changing that or not, or the size of tumor is changing or not. Or they could be a circulating marker, which is very kind of yeah, <clears throat> exciting right now. We are looking at, for instance, the two different ones, which I've mentioned here, CTC, circulating tumor cells, and CTDNA are the two which we are using more and more, especially CTC, the prostate cancer setting has shown to be fairly predictive of the outcome of the treatment are being used more and more. CTDNA is a recent thing, it's been using more and more. We are more or less collecting that one in majority of our studies, but specifically it has shown to have a very good value in the, uh, in the first line breast cancer setting. <clears throat> so, uh, you could measure that one and you look at the change with time and after treatment, and you can use that as a guidance for internal decision-taking. <clears throat> I'm gonna introduce two, another kind of FDA kind of introduced project called Project Frontrunner. You know, in past, the um, historically uh, manufacturers and sponsors, when they wanted to go uh, to the market, they had a fast to market strategy called which meant that you went and in a refractory setting, the first indication you tested was really lower line refractory patients. You tested your product in them because it allowed you to do a single arm study with a very rudimentary type of endpoint, which is ORR. And, and because it's a single arm study, you could recruit a very few patients <clears throat> and show efficacy in that setting and go fast to the market get your product in the market, and then you work your way from refractory setting to third line and second line, and hopefully to first line. Yeah, it was a, it worked. Many, pay, many products got their way to the market through that one, but at the same time, many products failed. Yeah, the main reason for that one was that it's extremely difficult to show signal of efficacy in the refractory setting. These are hardly beaten patients. We have gone through multiple cycles of treatments of one, two, four, five, ten 10 different treatment lines before ending on a refractory setting. And they are fairly sick. And then for any product to be working in that setting, either your product needs to be really effective or could be an act of God, more or less. <clears throat> yeah, so what the FDA has recommended and pushing for is to actually flip the situation 
is asking the sponsors, instead of going to the refractory setting, they're asking to go frontline. With frontline, more or less, they're asking for second line. And they're said, telling people that this is where the real value of the asset may lie, meaning there are a lot of patients out there in second line setting who are waiting for new assets. And in order to convince the sponsors to take such a risk and go away from that one is that this is actually giving them a, an incentive. And that incentive is that is actually telling them that if you do that one, I'm gonna give you an accelerated approval and you can use ORR as potentially with a duration of response, two things, ORR and duration of response. You can use that one in the frontline setting. And if you have signal, I'm gonna allow you to use accelerated approval and you can come back with a confirmatory study to get it full, fully approved. <clears throat> so you can see more and more of this project front runner to play a role in the US FDA and in registration of your products. Um, I'm gonna give you a very quick kind of alternative strategies for oncology drug development. I'm gonna focus first on preclinical setting. These are very robust on target advice I'm giving to sponsors, to, uh, to my own clients. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking them to, <clears throat> to uh, addition of cell line data, to use proper TGI models to predict efficacy for both monotherapy and combination. Yeah, it can be just one. Yeah, I'm asking them to use uh, and test different dosing regimens to be tested based on the degree of the receptor modulation and the 10 over rate of the receptor to put lesser focus on the systemic half-life, the PK half-life of product, because while that's important, the more important is a dynamic half-life, which could be very different than a PK half-life. The dynamic half-life is governed by your binding to the receptor and how frequently, how quickly your receptor gets turned over. So you could have potentially a shorter half-life product, which could be very effective because your receptor turnover is slower than your kinetic half-life. <clears throat> I'm also recommending to sponsors that they should do look at exploratory markers and include them in their studies, yeah, allowing measurement receptor modulation and by virtue of that one, allowing for PKPD modeling resp exposure response analysis. <clears throat> and while S9, S9 guidance allows sponsors to just test talks in one species, I'm actually recommending totally the opposite. I'm recommending to sponsors to do their best to test it in two different species. It has huge advantage. I know it's upfront, uh, upfront investment, but it will make life a lot easier to identify your start dose in human and that's essential for you to have significant savings down the road. A selection of an optimal human start dose is essential for success. <clears throat> a start dose which is um, too low will take a long time for you to build up to the range of efficacious. And, and that's where the cost is. Your cost, main cost is in human setting, in the clinical setting. The cost of the preclinical setting in IND enabling the studies are, are dismal and overshadowed by the cost per patients. The per patient cost in the US is around $350,000 per patient. So I guess that if people open up their eyes a bit and focus on a bit more on their kind of uh, their clinical development plan, it pays off. And, and if the start dose is too high in, in, in contrast, you will lead to safety events and liability and many assets probably even not survive that, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, but it comes to FIP and dose escalation part, my advice is that FIP plan for, try to limit your dose escalation to five dose levels only from the start to the end. <clears throat> um, it's highly desired to identify your MTD. The reason for that is that you know actually your safety margin. If you know MTD is here, and if you know your optimal biologic dose is, I don't know, if your MTD is 1,000, your OBD is about 500, you know that you have two-fold margin. And that's super important because you know how to handle your drug-drug interactions later on. <clears throat> the doses should be selected based on the predicted PK and not having overlapping kinetics, which we talked about before. They have a quick turnaround of identify your PK between those levels when you are escalating. Uh, the protocol should be written flexible enough, not needing to have amendments if you need to change the doses based on kinetics that you measure. Um, depending on safety profile of your asset, consider 
an accelerated dose escalation, meaning that you just run one patient in dose level one, you go to another patient in dose level two, and you can even challenge the FDA to go kind of larger steps. I have a client for, with whom I'm working right now, I'm trying to build the argument to go 200% from dose level one to dose level two, for instance. <clears throat> it could be considered. And then expand the number of patients at those groups where you believe you should reach your target efficacy. And then if you can, my preference would be that you should do your first inpatient study, your target population, instead of all comer, your target population actually carries your target. So not only you identify PK and safety, but also you are giving a chance to identify an efficacy signal. Yeah, and if you do all of this properly, you can characterize your PK and safety and efficacy signal, of course. <clears throat> And the dose expansion, I mean, we were talking about dose escalation, which is phase 1A, dose expansion of phase 1B. And in dose expansion cohort, phase 1B, you should run two doses. EM, the top dose should be your, your MTD. The lower dose should be your OBD. A dose identified from your TGI data. At the same time, the dose need to be separate from MTD by its kinetics. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you do that one, then you potentially have enough data by end of phase 1A and phase 1B to do the categorical analysis and then ER analysis and recommend your phase 2 dose on a very solid grounds for US FDA. And touch base with US FDA as quickly as you can. You can request a type D meeting, which is a new meeting that the FDA has been recommending. They introduced this in December, November -ish last year and is in place right now. You, could secure, you can meet with them and secure agreements about your strategy. <clears throat> Very quickly about different type meetings, uh, FDA has type A, B, B end of the phase, uh, phase one or phase two falls within that category. Type C meeting that a lot of sponsors are using today and this new type D meeting. <clears throat> the only thing, the difference for type D is that it will just allow you to talk about a couple of topics. In a type C meeting, you can have 10 different questions from FDA and you can get answer. But at the same time for a type D meeting, you cannot um, ask more than two divisions or three divisions to be involved. So more or less you can have the CMC group and OCP to talk about your dose finding, or you can have the DOP and OCP there, but you can have the toxicology team, CMC and X and Y and Z, because if you wanna have multiple divisions in that meeting, you end up with a type C meeting. <clears throat> and then um, alternative strategy for combination studies. I was until now talking about monotherapy. In combination studies, the FDA is recommending again a dose finding for combo studies. For every single combination, they're asking for a, a dose finding. For typically speaking for this type of studies, EM, and again, oncology treatment today is mostly doublet or triplets. <clears throat> um, you should do your best to keep the dose of an already marketed product at its, at, at its USPI label dose. And then you play around with the product, with your test products, which are not already marketed. You go up, you go down, but your start dose should be at least one level lower than your monotherapy dose. If you expect overlapping toxicity, such as neutropenia, you should even consider going to those levels lower and then work your way up safely. Um, and MIDD, uh, these are kind of probably my two last uh, kind of slides. The model informed drug development, it's something that US FDA is very keen about. They are very kind of excited about this. It means that you use modeling and simulation exposure response modeling in identifying your uh, phase two dose. <clears throat> um, and then my, my view here is upfront investment, proper identification of optimal dose will increase the value of your asset and the probability of technical success in a pivotal study. I mean, it's easy to try to do a miniature investment and try to save in the beginning, but one thing is for sure that that will not lead to your success. It will not add value to your assets either. <clears throat> Um, and my last slide would be a, a, an example of a super success that, uh, that Merck had 
by application of MIDD, what they did was that the, you, the k true has been on the market for, I don't know, about 12, 15 different indications. They started with a big per kick dosing. They eventually went to flap dosing. And then they eventually went from frequency of every three weeks to every six weeks. What happened was that their submission and approval for 400 milligram every six weeks was based only on modeling and simulation. So uh, they got that one as opposed to needing to do any more clinical studies. So they already had the uh, 400 millig uh, the 200 milligram every three weeks registered and they managed by using modeling and simulation to get the 400 milligram every six weeks on the market merely based on MIDD with minimum safety data added instead of needing to perform a new clinical study with this new dosing regimen to prove it was efficacious and safe. It saved them lots of money, lots of time, and they managed to just kind of make a, a quick change of regimen across all this, their different indications, all the 10, 12, 15 indications they had. And this was a huge success for how, how a company could use MIDD and their benefit if you do things properly in the beginning, upfront investment, collection of data, and an ER analysis will allow you to do stuff like this. Meaning later on, you can do cross indication change of dosing um, regimen without doing any clinical study. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope that I was able to give you a flavor of old chemotherapies, the new mod modalities that we are working with today, pros and cons of that one, a bit of flavor of the old style kind of identification of MTD and how we today identify the optimal dose and what the FDA would like to see in, from the sponsors. Thank you, and I take any questions you may have. Hi, Brush. So for the bi-specific antibodies overall, would you say because there are, they can target more than one thing, would you say they are more specific and there's less um, side effects? Or would you say it just kind of depends in terms of their better or worse in terms of side effects versus say monoclonal antibodies that just have one target? Yeah. <clears throat> So biospecifics by definition of targeting two different things are actually more effective than monoclonals. Yeah, the, what happens is that by virtue of that one, you buy more side effects too, unfortunately, depending on what is your kind of the tumor antigen that you're using. If, if you're using BCMA, with that comes, unfortunately, the, uh, the, uh, the CRS, for instance. So, the, and so the, you need to do a bit more elaboration of your dosing regimen, step up dosing. Uh, we managed to show, for instance, for our BCMA, that the first cycle, the first dose CMAX was highly correlated with uh, the CRS, which meant that we managed to then give a small dose, instead of giving a larger dose, we managed to split that dose to three smaller doses within the first week. And then we, and you have a, a small dose, small enough to still modulate the target, but not modulating that too much to give you some level of grade one CRS. And the second dose becomes almost very little. And from, from third dose forward, you almost have no CRS. Issues like that one are very rare for monoclonal antibodies and naked antibodies have lesser of issues like that one. So it's a bit kind of trade off. You are getting more efficacy, but with that one, you get more tricky side effects, which are manageable, but you need to spend more time and more investigation to figure it out. Thank you. Um, first, could you talk a little bit about uh, the drawbacks of PDCs over ADCs? Um, the drawbacks, yes. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the two PDCs that I work with, um, unfortunately, if you don't apply modalities like um, um, encapsulating them or, or, or using nanoparticles or something in order to increase their half-life, um, the, both of them are very effective, but at the same time, because their elimination is so super quick, their uptake is super rapid. I mean, yeah, their half-life, the, uh, the receptor half-life is probably about five to 10 minutes, depending on which type of receptor you are hitting. 
but more or less within 15, 20 minutes, there's nothing left in circulation. Yeah, with virtue of that one, it becomes, yeah, you need to kind of infuse these products frequently um, in order to hit the target time after time after time in order to you know, kind of maintain your efficacy. <clears throat> uh, so that's why PDCs, while they are having a much more penetration, they are easier to manufacture, they're cheaper and all that and has lesser Im Im immunogenicity, as so far, the two examples I've seen from PDCs as compared to ADCs, their, their huge disadvantage is that short half-life and inability to, to maintain the efficacy, unfortunately. Uh, Kurosh, I have, a, I have a question. Uh, you know, 20 some years ago, uh, for the first time, I heard about glioblastoma. Have you made any progress uh, with that indication? And oh, also, <laughs> in, your, uh, in your expert opinion, what is the least paid attention to oncology opportunity uh, by the industry that they should be paying attention that they're, they're kind of walking away? So the glioblastoma is unfortunately a very deadly disease and it still is an area of huge unmet clinical need. Um, many of oncology products don't even get into brain. And you know, many times you don't even want that to get to the brain because on the good side, yeah, it gets to the brain and you start kind of targeting your target. But at the same time, every time you bring a product to the brain, there's a reason that we have blood brain barrier to protect us. Yeah, every time you introduce products into the brain, you get a slew of side effects, unfortunately, unwanted ones. Yeah, which could be a very problematic for, for patients. Yeah, as so far, the, the main treatment kind of um, approach to glioblastoma is unfortunately resection and surgery, um, which has its own kind of drawbacks, such as damage to your to to other tissues. Unfortunately, many of these patients will be left with sequels, um, movement issues, and speech issues on that. Not many products get to the brain. We tried the uh, CDK46 on a compassionate setting. It had some effect for GBM, yeah, but as of today, really there are not many successful products for GBM. Being honest with you, Ron. Um, so it still it still remains as an area of unmet clinical need. Um, Areas of um, yeah, focus going forward <clears throat> is not that the industry doesn't want to. Some of it is very difficult to uh, identify products for. One of them, which is pretty close to my heart, is of course pancreatic cancer. It's extremely deadly. Um, and so far, we are just left with platinum, cisplatin, and really poisonous products, which doesn't really do much for patient. Uh, it just probably gonna improve their yeah, survival by a couple of months, if even that. Yeah. And so far, any single product we have tested in, in pancreatic cancer have failed. It has been total graveyard. <clears throat> um, you usually pancreatic cancer comes uh, with significant metastasis in your, in your liver. So by the time the unfortunately patients start complaining with stomach ache or comes down with jaundice, they are in stage four, probably with a couple of large tumors in your pancreas with extensive metastasis in their liver. And by the time of diagnosis to death, probably two, three months at tops. <clears throat> so that's an area which is really kind of, we need to have better products for, we have done huge strides in many indications, breast cancer, huge strides, hematologic malignancies, huge strides, even lung cancer, huge strides. I mean, um, introduction of checkpoint inhibitors made, made a huge deal and then made a huge improvement of, the, um, of OS for many of these indications. But if you were asking me today, what's out there? Yeah, GBM and pancreatic cancer. Thank you so much, Kurosh. We really enjoyed your talk today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for- Pleasure so much. Um, My pleasure. And another round of applause. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.